All right, Director Garrett, would you like to kick us off? Okay. Madam Chair, uh, members of the, the Commission, appreciate the opportunity to provide an update on, on our activities related to the strategic business plan. Um, so today, we're, we're going to update you on that effort and request your input and feedback over the course of this conversation. Um, you have been provided in your supplemental package a detailed accounting of the work uh, to date. What we'll do today with these fine folks uh, sitting at the dais there is give you a highlight of the effort and the initiative here. Remind us of the purpose. Um, so the strategic business plan will set the agency's direction over a five-year horizon, but that said, it is a living document and uh, will no doubt update and refine over the course of that five-year period and probably beyond. Our ultimate goal in the process is to bring focus, a clarity of purpose, and a discipline in identifying the agency priorities, outcomes, objectives, and then those measures that ensure that we're tracking and moving forward and best positioning the agency to deliver on its mission. A quick look at the uh, timeline indicates that we're in the midst of a transition phase right now, a critical moment, maybe a milestone. Uh, as we move from the planning phase into the development or the creation stage, I think the star there notes it's uh, create. We believe it's prudent to pause right now, share the work that we have done to date, the paths that we have started to walk down, um, look at the various recommendations that continue to bubble up from our work, uh, and thus my team here in front of you will uh, uh, engage that conversation and look forward to a healthy discussion here. So for the agenda as it plays itself out. First, I uh, want you to know that we have reached across and down into the organization to engage a variety of managers and staff to inform us. It's not the usual suspects coming around the table. So again, new perspectives, breadth and depth of interest. You'll recall that we identified four working groups that were charged to engage in a deeper dive into the key themes or those core elements that were identified by a leadership team, uh, but also were identified through Pivotal's baseline assessment of the agency that the Commission had engaged in, the PESTLE analysis um, that was conducted earlier this fall. To remind the Commission, the four, those four working groups uh, are as follows, governance and accountability, workforce, technology, data, and then strategic investments. So today I have asked the leaders of those work groups to come before you and share the information that they've learned through the process we've engaged to date, as well as the recommendations that continue to form. Secondly, uh, I want you to know there is a sub-team or group uh, of the Strategic Planning Leadership Task Force that is engaging in the visioning. Uh, exercise specific to the agency. So this is reflecting and reviewing on our mission, our goals, our values, and we're going to hear an update on that conversation as well. And then finally, Ms. Bruce will uh, uh, bring us on home, so to speak, in terms of here's where we stand, here's where we're going in terms of next step. Again, our intent is to share a pretty high level flyover of the activities associated with these various groups uh, and the ideals um, that they've generated to date. Um, as I said before, I believe we are at a, a, at a pivotal milestone today, and if there's anything the Commission hears that there's discomfort with, now's the time to raise your hand um, because we can pivot in new directions here. Madam Chair, I think with tee up, um, with that as tee up, so to speak, I'd like to now pass the torch to Amy Ramsdale, who is on point for the governance and accountability team. Good afternoon, Chair Bainey, com Commissioners. My name is Amy Ramsdale. I'm the Motor Carrier Division Administrator. I had the pleasure of serving as the leader for the Governance and Accountability Working Group. And while all of the topics are important, this one sets the foundation for the strategic business plan. It helps us guide the work identified in the plan. And our assignment was to evaluate our current structures, roles, and processes, and to define direction set priorities, and align our accountability across the agency. What we learned from our work group and from the information we gathered reinforced what had already been identified in the McKinsey Report and the Strategic Business, line ba baseline, strategic business Plan Baseline Assessment. 
Our current governance efforts need attention and action, and our ability to support and deploy a strategic business plan and build transparency depend upon stronger agency-wide governance and support. So we had two items that we recommended from our work group. Those are create a cross or work on a cross-divisional decision-making group and improve our governance support and structure. And we're looking for connections across ODOT at all levels, up and down the organization that are engaged in key decisions. So first, establish a cross-divisional body that has the following responsibilities. Did you have any questions before I move into this? Thing on each slide, okay. We talked about governance being the brain of the agency and connecting through the nervous system of the agency. This first targeted recommendation is to create that which we don't have, a unified agency-wide leadership group that holds responsibility for reviewing and setting priorities across all divisions and functions. Today this is done informally, and we're looking for an opportunity to align common goals with keeping the lights on and maintaining those day-to-day -day activities. This central group should not only set our course, but it should own and coordinate the performance measures to ensure strong accountability. Our second uh, recommendation revolves around better coordination and communication of those priorities. Today, we have various groups involved in this work, but how they interact, who is responsible, who has decision-making authority, and avoiding doing too much can, be, it can be lead to confusion. There is a need to increase the discipline in managing our priorities and our initiatives. In order to succeed in improvement of our governance and accountability, we must devote resources to support the assessment and transition our work. We need to ensure the purpose of leadership and management teams are clear and identify those roles, responsibilities, and decision-making authority. Communicate that clarity of purpose across all divisions and work units and sections, and connect those to agency priorities. And then improve our ability to hold our individuals and our teams responsible for delivering, delivering those initiatives to key milestones, and to create continuous a feedback loop so that we can constantly improve. If there's any questions? Uh, no, but I would say that I think when you um, look at any structures, on occasion there can be uh, apprehension about new accountability within um, which I, we've gone through similar in, in work that I've done but where it should have been there in the, to begin with but then we've operated in a certain way and now we have added scrutiny maybe accountability how do you intend to manage through that and how do you um, it, ensure that ability to hold people accountable yeah. Part of what our work group talked about was, I think, I think there's a desire for that. When we talk about employee engagement surveys and other work that we've done, I believe staff have a desire to see that change, but you need to manage that with a strong change management process to ensure that people are comfortable and you're taking measured steps. All right, good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Schroll. For the record, I'm the HR director. And I am here to talk about the, the workforce work group. And the workforce group explored a multitude of issues and challenges that we face currently today. We know that we have committed, dedicated, and passionate employees who do the work that's necessary each and every day. Yet we discussed uh, what, is the, what, what it is that we need to ensure that we have the talent, the engagement, and the capacity to meet the new challenges along with addressing the next generation of future leaders and staff. So with that, our assignment really was to focus on how to build a sustainable workforce, not just for today's needs, but for the future requirements. And through our conversations, we learned that there are many obstacles that we face today when it comes to hiring, retaining, and <clears throat> leading our teams. We, re we recognize that we need to be more agile, stronger, and forward thinking. 
And we felt that in order to do this, it was everyone's commitment to come to the, to come to the table to help. This was not just an HR's issue to solve. So therefore, we had um, multiple conversations. I could come to you with a laundry list of recommendations for the OTC as well as the task force to consider. But we truly felt like at this point in time, what was important for us as an agency was to be very strategic and intentional in our, in our recommendations. And we have two specific recommendations. One is on the development of our leadership to cultivate and, and uh, identify a stronger leadership, along with increasing our employee capability to help with the engagement and overall job fulfillment. So I think we can all recognize that these are certainly not two key things that are new to us. They're not revolutionary. They were high, highlighted and identified as themes in the McKinsey, Re McKinsey report, along with um, ODOT's prior engagement surveys. But with that, we truly feel like we need to take the step and move forward. So on behalf of the workforce group, I'd like to describe just briefly on what leadership excellence means for us. It includes, um, leadership excellence includes improving leadership capability, which helps us identify and develop the right type of leader that we need for the future. And it can be accomplished through rethinking our performance management structure and accountability expectations. ODOT has a deep desire to ha empower leaders at every level. And what that means is that we want role models. We want folks that we can look up to and look out to at the same time. In, in other words, we want that see it, believe it type mentality that enhances the credibility and trust within the agency. The second recommendation is on employee capability. How do we build that? What does that look like? It's two words, really. Two words are connect and value. Employees want to connect with the greater vision of ODOT. They want to, which enhances that link between what it is that they do each and every day to the vision, to the mission, and to the priorities that the agency will have and will have and currently has and will have in the future. So we feel that by focusing on these two key areas, we will enhance our current capability and enable our employees, current and future, to be the ambassadors of the agency. Thank you. Do you have any questions for me? So I have a couple questions. So if we have tried this in the past and it hasn't worked, what are we trying this time that's different? In terms of if we've had surveys that have come back that we've struggled in this area, because really for us to implement Houseful 2017, all hands on deck in terms of being able to make sure that our workforce is ready and feels trained and supported and, um, you know, in the game to be able to help. Uh, what do you see that's different this time than maybe what we've done in the past? So Chair Bainey, um, Commissioners, um, my name is Kelly Bruce. I'm with the Strategic Business Services branch of ODOT and I'm the project manager for the Strategic Business Plan. So um, I'll just kind of jump in there on this one. Um, I think that none of this is new and while we've been continuously working on these issues and I think most organizations have, um, each generation there brings another set of these same issues. Um, so we have, I, I wouldn't say that we haven't been successful. I think we have been successful. Okay. What we're doing now is narrowing in on a couple of key areas that will help us with our priorities. So this is an issue that has many facets to it. And uh, I think what we've done in the past is try to address too many of them at the same time. So rather than try to address everything and fix everything, we want to hone in and really narrow our focus on these two areas, which we think will enable us to better um, address the rest of the priorities of the agency. Excellent, thank you. Just, um, and I don't know, Jennifer, if maybe this is one for you and maybe it's challenging to, to answer, but if we look at a 10-year horizon, obviously we have um, a retirement bubble and we have a lot of talent here um, that may be getting to that point where we're, you know, m moving on and retiring. Um, one, are we competitive in a compensation standpoint? Are we able to attract and retain talent that will allow us to execute 
this bill? And if we're not, are we being honest about the conversation? Because we as commissioners need to go uh, down the street somewhere and say, hey, we've got a, we need to make a request here to, to, to up how we're addressing this so that we can attract and retain talent because we're going to be losing um, a lot of institutional knowledge to retirement um, and otherwise. And I just, I think it's one of these things that, it, are we as a commission empowering the department to be successful in the long run? And are some of these kind of fundamental HR issues ones that are difficult to address as employees, but we have an obligation to address as a commission? And I'm going to piggyback just a little bit as well. And if we can't get to that place, what is our pathway for contracting or supplementing that work if we are not able to retain and attract to be able to get the work done? Please. But I do think there's a request here is yeah. like, what are we? What does it look like for this department from a retirement attrition standpoint in the next 10 years as we execute uh, this bill? I mean, is it like, where are we? Where are we likely to lose people, and where do we need to backfill? And do we have the capacity within the organization to to move people up, or to go outside and attract talent? And if the and if the answer to the question is no, what do we need to do to fix it to make the place competitive to to get and retain the top talent? And and, and just to pile on. Um, <laughs> So we recently did in our law firm an analysis of essentially what's happening with the baby boomers, um, when are they leaving, and uh, it, was, it was a fascinating study because some of us that are getting there um, were able to tell our peers, you, you need to come clean, you know, if you're leaving in six months, just tell us <laughs> so we can plan for it, or a year and a half. Just Tell us. So uh, I wonder if something like that, at least some level, and they have many, many, many more employees uh, than I can't imagine what that would look like at Nike. But um, but uh, something like that, at least through some tier of critical workers. I wonder if you've done it, and if you haven't done it, whether it's doable. Quite a few questions. Yeah, <laughs> but they're all outstanding, and they're on point. And they're engaged, I think. I think just to, to, to maybe parse this out, and Jennifer, correct me if I, uh, if I swim out of the lane. Commissioner O'Holler, you ask a, a legitimate question in terms of 10 years. I can tell you where we are in five years in terms of workforce. We have, in, a, in the next five years, roughly 30% of our workforce are, will be eligible to retire. Um, so those folks who have the 25 to 30 years of experience and wisdom of, of walking the trail. Uh, they can go. Every conversation about PERS, benefit packages, even if nothing is done, just the conversation itself ripples through the organization and you see waves of retirement. Because I think people are just doing the math. They understand what they have right now, the unsurety of what may transpire. Not that that's not a legitimate conversation because something needs to be done about the PERS situation. The math does not work there. But that has a ripple effect into the organization. So we're vulnerable. And we're not unique. That's an enterprise conversation. Um, with, with, I think, the Department of Corrections probably leading the way with about 50% of their workforce eligible wow. to retire in the next five years or so. And maybe right now, to be very honest with you. In terms of compensation, the, the enterprise of the state of Oregon is supposed to be a market-driven entity which means we align with the markets. And in some cases, in some job classifications, we are. In others, we are not. Where the greatest vulnerability, given House Bill 2017 exists, is in the area of project delivery. Um, now, we're working right now as we speak to say, listen, given the charge, given the exposure that we have, if we don't have the right, right roster and the skill set, we won't be able to deliver the mandates embedded in House Bill 2017. So this is playing uh, itself at the highest levels, um, specific to this, in, in, uh, this agency, but also specific 
to the enterprise itself. We're trying to find where there are those vulnerabilities um, to compensate for those. Because we not, are, we not only will lose people to retirement, we are losing some of our best and brightest because they can walk down the street and get a better job that I can't even compete with lesser responsibility. Um, and so how we align with market, both public and private, is real. We have some history when there's an infusion of money. The private sector uh, has a tendency to cherry pick some of our best and brightest, and, and we see people move on that front. We also are challenged by the, the great infusion of money that came to transportation, not only in the state of Oregon, but in the state of Washington, in the state of California, in the state of Idaho. We're all fishing in the same pool for all intents and purposes here. So we're trying to attract folks from across the nation now. Compensation, where people live, geography, uh, the geographic issues. If you live in Portland versus you live in, let's just say, Lone Rock, to use our password here. A little different um, standard of living, cost associated with those living. Those are real. This is not new, as Ms. Bruce indicated, but I think we're turning our attention to the greater conversation on mission and value. Once we understand that, then I think you can turn your attention. What type of individual do we want to retain and attract at the Oregon Department of Trace, uh, Transportation in terms of competencies, proficiencies? We can be a little more strategic, uh, you know, not so much strategic, maybe more surgical in our investment on that front. And I think maybe to wrap this up, it's not only the retirement conversation, it is the retention and recruitment. We've got to change the way we recruit in the state of Oregon, the way we do business here at the Department of Transportation. And I'm just going to be blunt in saying we have a tendency to throw a net out, and we hope a fish swims into it. Rather than saying, uh, you, you know that Bruce woman? I want her to wear the ODOT uniform. Let's go out and actually recruit her to come to the agency. We need certain tools to do that, Commissioner, and, and to the Commission as a whole. This agency is leaning into it specific to the parochial interest of ODOT, but also the enterprise conversation that I think will compromise um, public service in general. Because my concern is we won't be able to attract the best and brightest kids into public service here because we can't compete. We can't compete because we have a deficit in our IT uh, infrastructure, in our financial infrastructure, and let's just say the, uh, I'm not sure the environment is as healthy as it needs to be in terms of the tone and discourse that plays itself out in public service. All those are variables in this, uh, in this very complicated equation. And maybe just to wrap this up to the point that I think you were making, um, this agency would, uh, uh, would completely embrace the commission in forming that discussion uh, in terms of positioning us for success. When was the last time we did a class and comp study? And is that done at the state, statewide, or is that done agency? Am I striking no, a nerve here? No, 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 you're not. Okay. It, this is a legitimate conversation. Okay. It's, it, it plays itself out on a couple different levels. For representative individuals, it's done about every two years. It had been over a decade, maybe two decades, in the management ranks here. There was a class and comp effort engaged. It was informed a couple years ago. But for a variety of reasons, we've somewhat stalled uh, in terms, again, that true alignment with market here. And that's an enterprise conversation. Good. Thank you. Not, Madam Chair, uh, I, I think it, it does kind of strike a chord that it's something we need to look at. I think so, absolutely. <laughs> We're, we, might, we don't want to be drugged by it. We want to actually get in front of it. So uh, please continue. We obviously are interested in uh, what you have happening. So. Jennifer, is it back to you or to Tom or who? Okay, great. Thank you. Chair Bainey, members of the commission, for the record, my name is Tom Fuller. I'm the communications section manager for the Oregon Department of Transportation. And I'm here to speak about the data and technology work group of the Strategic Business Plan Task Force. And the pages in your supplemental review packet are 18 through 26 if you want to um, reference those at all. Let me clarify first uh, with a couple of definitions, because when you talk about data, you talk about technology, you can pretty much fill in the blank. So we defined technology as software, applications, hardware, 
infrastructure and innovations that enable us to do our work. We define data as raw facts and numbers that we use to develop knowledge and which we rely upon to run an organization and to meet our customer and our partner needs. So with that in mind, we had a very dedicated group of folks from across and up and down the agency that got together. And in fact, there's a picture on the PowerPoint of one of our meetings. You can see the top of my head in the back of that picture. And we were given an assignment. And that assignment was to really evaluate the needs, the capabilities, and the challenges regarding the use of data and technology at the Department of Transportation. We wanted to look at what's working well and where our biggest opportunities lie to enhance both our current use and also our future use of technology and data to make information more reliable, more accessible, and more useful. So what did we learn? We learned that our overall approach to kind of defining the needs, the investment in data and technology is admirable, but not well coordinated. Our group looked at it in terms of a puzzle. There are a lot of pieces out there, but we're not quite sure where they fit together to make the big picture. And it leaves our, our agency at sort of a technology debt where we have systems and infrastructure that is aging and not sustainable, but do we have a good plan for how to move that forward and more than that, look toward the future so that we stay ahead of the trends so that we're serving our customers with the best data and technology that we can. We want to be more proactive and less playing catch up. Right now we spend significant time, money and resources, but it's not in a coordinated way. We need to channel it to create more benefit. So our recommendations basically are that we need stronger agency-wide coordination and more deliberate actions to receive this uh, benefit, this sort of return on investment, if you will, both in the short term and also in the long term. We have a lot of positive efforts that we're building on, but we need to unify our decision making process and our actions to support more effective technology and data investment priorities. So how are we going to do that? That's the next slide here. We recommend an integrated approach to, to address our data and technology needs. We have a couple of very important pieces that are already coming into place in this puzzle that will help us along. We're very fortunate that really good minds around the, uh, the agency were already thinking in these terms. One of them is the DOT strategic data business plan. And if you haven't had a chance to read it, I would uh, recommend it to you because it's very forward leaning. How can we uh, understand what data we have, how can we make it more reliable and sort of the, the truth, the true record, and then how can we um, make it more useful and available to our customers and our partners. So we're going to build on this rather than reinvent it. The second one is, uh, I just had a, attended a presentation of this, uh, what time is passing too quickly, two days ago, thank you. Uh, which right here in this room, which is um, a, a technology assessment through a uh, contract with the Gartner Group, where we looked across the enterprise at all of the or applications that we have created, and what is their state? Uh, are they ones that should be migrated or eliminated? Are they ones that should be invested in? And it's, it's a very detailed assessment that gives us a roadmap with how to move forward. So we have both a, um, a way to move forward with technology and a way to move forward with data. And I look at it as kind of a three-layer cake. The bottom of the cake, the bottom layer, is what I would call the discovery layer. What are the needs that are out there in the enterprise and in our customers, and what are the resources that exist? The middle layer I call the collaboration la layer. We talked about in our group, work group the, uh, and in this, the presentation about the Gartner assessment, about the need to develop a new discipline in our organization. It goes by many names out there, the business relationship manager, um, we, we, we could call them a, a data and tech strategist, but they are those that stand between the need and the resource and then the final layer, which is coordination, and are able to 
bridge that gap, look out in the enterprise and assess and understand the needs, look at the technology and the data and understand how to make those connections and then be able to help build business cases that move up into that top layer, which is coordination. So it starts with enterprise governance. You've heard that term before when it comes to agency decision making. The group also felt that it was important when it comes to data and technology decision making because right now at the Department of Transportation, many decisions around data and technology are made by what we call communities of interest, but they often act in bubbles or in silos and they either are unaware or perhaps even unwilling to share resources, share ideas and have more effective development of technology and data. So this group would evaluate the gaps using the assessments that we already have, look for synergies and ways that we can um, coordinate our approach to data and technology. This group would be not an IT-led organization. It would be a business-led organization with strong partnerships with our information technology services branch. The second approach then is strategic modernization, where we would have stronger governance building on our recent efforts and then establish principles for uh, going forth and plans for how we would better utilize our technology and data resources. So we would build on our recent assessments, establish the principles, and then develop this roadmap with how we move forward. Then and only then, I think that we can have the third uh, part of our recommendation, which is the focused development, whereas today it's very unfocused. We are, are uh, suggesting that we can be much more focused as we work on our governance and our strategy, supporting the, um, the enterprise from the, the bottom part, the collaborative part, and then bubbling up to the uh, coordination part. We want to uh, enhance the roles of people around the organization, find ways they can work cross-divisionally and one of the examples that was used was um, a two parts of the organization, both using data sets, both wanting applications written in order to analyze and use those data sets. And the realization that except for maybe a couple of fields, those data sets are identical. And instead of spending all the time and resources to develop two sets of data, two applications, which then must be maintained over time, we have a business analyst that helps them create one very reliable data set with one application overlaying it with two sets of business rules so that they are able to both obtain their goal, but we have become more efficient as an organization. Questions? Good afternoon, Paul Mather, Highway Division Administrator. I am actually sitting in for Frank Reading, who was the leader of our group, um, and going to talk to you about strategic investment. Um, I was on this work group and was really uh, enjoyed working on it. As the, during my career, I've seen um, frustration within the department in our decision-making processes, as well as I've been as I've been in front of you, seeing commission at various times frustrated. Um, in, in making uh, investment decisions uh, for the uh, for the department, our job was to um, look at those existing processes that we have and try to optimize our decision making processes. So when we we talk about this, it's the uh, transportation uh, plan that you um, develop, the modal plans that go with that. How does that translate down to the stip and then to the budget, to our level of service conversations? What, what guidance do we use to make those, make those decisions? What we found is that there, um, you know, there's, there's gaps in that, uh, in that decision. And there's, a, there's a big kind of chasm that we kind of jump over from this 20, 30 year visionary document down to day to day decisions or biennial um, budgets or even stip cycles in our, um, um, in our decision making processes. So what we look for is in our recommendation is just better integration and alignment of our priorities and to help find a way to bridge that, uh, that kind of chasm between our visionary documents and our day-to-day -day, uh, day -day guidance. What we wanted to do is build on the work that we did about a year ago with the Transportation Commission in our strategic investment strategy. 
Uh, that, in our mind, was an example of what we were trying to accomplish here. Um, while it was just a, a kind of a subset of what needed to, it, it gave us a good ex tangible example that we could use to, to build on. Um, what we were looking for was a document that helped us manage the, all the trade-offs that we have. We don't have enough money for our bridges. We don't have enough money for our pavements. We don't have enough money for the IT systems that we have deficits in our, in our um, inside of our organization. But we wanted to have a good understanding of the condition of the system as well as a good understanding of the condition of the agency. And as we make our investment decisions, whether it's a budget decision or a STIP decision, that we are strategically putting those resources in the right, in the right place. Um, so this diagram, I think, really kind of illustrates what I've been trying to describe. Uh, we have those modal plans and the high engagement with the commission as we go through those. But if you're on the commission, um, the majority of commissioners in a 20, 25 year span are not part of the development of that transportation plan. They may be of the uh, various topic plans or modal plans, but not of the overall transportation plan. And we go from those documents all the way down to STIP decisions, which we're going to talk about later in the agenda, biennial budget decisions, uh, level of service. So how long are the wait lines in DMV? How often do we have snow plows out on various roadways and maintenance? Uh, we look to make those kind of decisions, and what we point all the way back up to is the transportation plan. It's a long ways back up to that visionary document. So we envision a document that's in between that that helps every commission to give us guidance that when we hit a step cycle or we hit a budget cycle, we have the same strategic guidance that we're all using as a reference point either to make daily decisions or to make decisions as a budget or a STIP. And so you can see your fingerprints on our recommendations that come back to you from a budget standpoint or a STIP standpoint. I've been in front of uh, you and other commissions many times, and as we talk about the STIP, you'll ask a question, and my answer is, well, that you gotta wait for the budget for that conversation. And we're in the budget conversation, you ask a question and we say, well, you gotta wait till the STIP for that conversation. This hopefully helps binds that together to give us that document that we, then we can point back to and we can come to you with recommendations where it's clear your direction has been given to us and that's why we made the budget recommendation or the STIP recommendation that's in front of you or why you see different levels of service across the department, not just in highway, whether it's motor carrier or DMV, that us as division administrators and managers were using this document to make those uh, daily decisions in our level of service and then our work priorities. We've got the work priorities that we're talking to you in front of you today. It is also very helpful for us to get guidance on those as well as what isn't a priority today. And we need to put off and stay focused on those priorities. Um, so this strategic investment strategy, again, just really builds upon the work that you did um, a year ago and makes it much more comprehensive across the department that we can use, again, in our daily, uh, decision making in our biennial budget decision making as well as in our various STIP cycle. So this will have, um, I think of all the work items, probably the most, by far the most engagement of the commission um, in the development of this and the direction we're going to need from you to be uh, successful here. I really think that this is incredible because it'll help us also when we have federal opportunities, we can mm -hmm. be more strategic, we're not we're, we, when the legislature is saying, you know, we want to go forward with, you know, insert whatever the great idea is, and we want to say we'll invest here, mm -hmm. we won't be having to go back to the drawing board, draw from those uh, topic <coughs> plans, and draw from all of our goals. We can have that in a really easily accessible document that'll be able to be refreshed and um, help to tell that story as we go forward. I like the refinement of what we what we started. We have a great foundation, but I think right. that um, right. that's what we take to the legislature every year of additional needs within the system. So great, other comments or thoughts? Okay. Just one yes, last thought, please. I think it, it uh, also helps uh, kind of speak into the conversation this morning with legislators as they have, talk about their expectations for you. This strategic plan can help answer some of their questions and show your guidance of, on the agency. So uh, good afternoon. Uh, for the record, my name is Jerry Bohard. I'm the Transportation Development Division Administrator. And um, I helped co-chair um, sort of uh, revisiting and, and potentially refreshing our mission and our values um, with uh, Travis um, Brower. And um, 
we, we I think we recognized as we went through the strategic business plan, it was really important to look at the foundation of the agency as we did that. Um, so uh, many of you obviously are aware of our mission, <laughs> probably aware of our values. You may not be as aware that we have some goals and some strategies as well. So sort of recognizing that we had a lot sort of embedded in that what helped guide the agency. So as we went through this work, we actually revisited um, not only some of the missions of other DOTs, um, or their visions, but also that we found within the agency. I know, um, for instance, in Mill Creek, we have a vision statement and we have um, our strategies and so on, So, which is very common, I think, if you were to ask uh, most folks sitting along this table that we have something uh, relative to our division that sort of falls into this as well. Um, so we really recognize that there was some work to do here. I'll tell you, this is probably the one um, where it's the most uh, drafty, for lack of a better word. We've been having a lot of internal discussions. I know that uh, Kelly Bruce had, I think, four focus group meetings um, on Tuesday and Wednesday of this week. So again, this is just uh, work um, that's uh, uh, going on right now. So this is sort of our um, working draft relative to the update of the mission. Um, you can see in a lot of ways it looks very familiar to our existing mission. We were trying to, I think, refresh it, kind of bring uh, new words that perhaps resonated. Uh, so for instance, Commissioner Bainey, the word healthy. So that's obviously been a theme as we think about that. Um, the interesting thing and some of the input that um, I've heard from Kelly relative to the conversation that we've had so far is that the first half of this statement resonated um, with uh, folks within the agency that she's talked with, the second half not so much. That was pretty consistent with the existing mission as well. So, um, so still have a little bit um, of work to do. But important to remember when we think about the mission, it's what we do, how do we do it, with whom do we do it for, um, what value are we bringing, and really how do we make it compelling, how do we inspire. So, so as we think about the words that we want to put there, those are the things that are going through our head. I think, you know, most importantly, um, is that we recognize keeping the mission um, fairly short um, that uh, people can um, repeat it. And, and we've seen the real value in that. There's a lot of ownership right now to the existing vision and we, or mission, excuse me, and we certainly um, wanted to take advantage of that. This is sort of the first sort of working draft that we have with I wanted to throw in just really quickly. So, and uh, just for consideration, um, and maybe I'm the, the Lone Ranger on this one, but I, one piece is that we're, we're talking about tax dollars. And so when you think about the public good and the accountability piece that we're all living under as well, I just, was there dialogue about, uh, I wouldn't, I know it sounds really dry and boring, fiscally responsible, uh, cost effective, but I mean there are many terms that we could use. But is there a place in there that that's, because that really is what we should be doing as well? So, so Commissioner, I, um, as you recall from the existing mission, we talk about economic and then we also talk about livable communities. And those were two words that people really struggled with. What did we mean by them? What did they mean to us as an agency um, versus, ha versus just the state in general? So that was one of the reasons we started to look at the word prosperous to give us a little bit of flexibility with regards to that and also with the word healthy. So that, that was sort of a lot of the conversation that we we're having. So I would say yes, we're very very in tune to sort of the economic responsibilities that we have. Certainly, we heard that um, Senator Boquist this morning. Number one thing is that, you know, in order for um, the agency to move, the state to move forward, it's all about transportation. So that's why I think there's probably a little bit of work that we need to do on the second half, but that certainly was the intent relative to the prosperous. Matt, I want to make sure your question was answered, at least the way I interpreted it. It was more on the lines of stewardship mm -hmm. and that right. obligation rather than economic so, overlay. Right. So I was going to get to that. You're going to get to that. Okay. <laughs> the, and I'm thinking the financial stewardship. We just call mm -hmm. it outright so that yeah. we are leading from the, we, we understand there's a responsibility here. Right. So um, when we talked about the values, I think the one of the things that when we think about the values, it's how we do our work. How, how do we as staff do our work? What do we think about as we do our work? And so um, one of the things in our um, other values that they had activities, it, it, it was sort of a mismatch of different things. So what we were trying to get to with this working draft is really how do we think about it when we do our work? So to your point, what we were trying to get to in integrity 
was as public stewards. We're committed to being accountable and transparent and hold ourselves and others to the highest ethical standards. So we were trying to get to the public stewardship and again that accountability, which is certainly a theme through House Bill uh, 2017. Again, maybe um, some work that we need to do on the words, but we certainly had uh, your intent in mind as we were working on that value. So. so I'll just close by saying one of the things that you don't see up here yet is the vision. Um, as an agency, that isn't something we've had agency-wide as a vision, so we've been doing some work on a vision. Um, I think we had a draft language, and I think if Kelly were to tell you that she talked to 100 people, 50 liked it, and 50 really didn't like it. So we still have a little bit of work to do on the vision, so um, I would say uh, stay tuned for that part of it. Let me get this back to Kelly. Mm -hmm. Are they done? Thank you. Oh. Did you have another question? Um, so, again, as we noted, we've done a lot of work so far on the strategic business plan, um, and it's really the foundation work that we've gotten to at this point. Um, so this is what we will begin to build the detailed plan on, um, and all of the ideas and the information that the working groups provided, um, in addition to our current list of priorities, which is something that we've begun listing out as well so that we can take a closer look at what those are um, in relation to uh, any new priorities. Um, and we'll be building the what and the whys for each of those as we go along. Um, that work will start um, over the next month and a half and the goal will be then to um, launch into the implementation in January. Oops. So our next steps um, is to really finalize the work on the mission, vision, and values um, that we were just discussing, um, confirm the outline of the plan documents and the plan content, and so that's one of the things that we're looking for your direction on today. Um, are these the right arenas for us to be looking at? Um, and then we do want to do some ex um, stakeholder engagement, but we want to be very targeted with that. Um, I think most of the engagement we're looking at would be post appro your approval of the plan, so it would be more of an awareness and getting um, uh, a lot of um, just understanding around what we're doing. But there are a few groups we think we would be worthwhile to engage <coughs> with prior to that finalization in January. And so we're thinking um, one of the groups would be the ACT chairs, especially in terms of the strategic investment concept, so that they can kind of grasp what we're talking about there. Um, and potentially the Transportation Policy Committee might be another group, um, the modal chairs, uh, just, to, just to get some initial weigh in and not um, surprise anybody down the line. Um, so at this point, I'm, I'm sorry, do we, go ahead. Do we have a do question? Have a question? Commissioner Van Brocklin, do you have a question? Okay, just checking. Okay, please. So, um, so what I would ask at this point is, are there any lingering concerns? And let me just list what I've heard so far from the discussion today that um, one of the things we really need to look at from the workforce perspective is our retirement plane, you know, and our ability to recruit and retain folks in, um, especially in terms of our ability to deliver the House Bill Plan. I believe we are doing that work now. Um, and then also look at how do we incorporate that fiscal responsibility a little more clearly and crisply in, in the mission and the values piece. Um, any other concerns, red flags that you have, um, things that you see glaringly missing? Well, how will we measure? That, that's our next step. You so, know, it feels mm -hmm. like aspirational but not mm -hmm. measurable. And so with a strategic business plan, it should be, you know, here's, and it should be a, a rolling kind of refreshed so yes. that it's not just one and done. Right, right. Uh, so help me get comfort with how we're going to measure some of these what feel they're critical but they feel a little nebulous in terms of you know trying to nail jello to a tree or something yeah and they are at this point um so the initial plan the high level plan is going to be less tangible um it's more of our direction and at, over the next um as we move into the implementation phase that's where we'll get into very specific actions so some of the action pieces um related to this like setting up a governance structure that's a little more tangible. 
Um, but then as we move into what actions are we really going to take to improve the workforce? What actions are we really going to take in terms of the technology and the data? Um, I think the strategic investment is a pretty tangible one. So once we identify in the implementation phase what the specific actions are, we can attach those measures to that. Um, yeah, this is a, a good start. I, uh, I wanted to circle back around the workforce piece because it seems like this is obviously a very important element <clears throat> related to the prosperity and success of the department. Um, Given the transitions and just the need for the future workforce and obviously being able to accommodate all the changes in the, in the system and in the industry, technology, quite frankly, how do we, how do we keep up with those trends? Um, I would, I would highly encourage you to look at one more element, which really kind of threw me off, which I didn't hear much, or I didn't see much content relative to it. On page 11, when you look at your makeup of the workforce, that's a very diverse bunch of people right there. But it doesn't talk about that. Um, it doesn't speak to what this group, which I would assume based on this imagery, would be what your aspirational workforce makeup would look like. And I don't see any content that supports that imagery right there. And I would assume that for the broader public, they would they would concur with that assumption. And I, what I was gonna where I was gonna go with this was is that in I think believe I believe in Portland, the elementary school system right now is over 50% diverse students. That is a major demographic shift that's coming upon us. And in the country as a whole, I believe it'll be over 50% people of color by like 2040. So these trends that are coming in these shifts, if we're as an agency looking to recruit that next generational workforce and we're looking to be prepared for what our future system is gonna look like and all the needs that we have, we are going to have to communicate to that cultural demographic. And it's very prudent and important that we, that we outline that and we identify that and we talk to that. I can see it's aspirational here, but it's not explicit. And I would prefer that we get a little bit more explicit around what our true goals are uh, as it relates to our workforce and our, and our growth opportunities as an agency in the future. Because quite frankly, I, I honestly believe that there's some elements in there that says that speaks to our competitiveness with the private sector and may not be perfect, but it's not bad. I mean, this, this is a pretty good job this agency provides with the benefits that come along with it. And I would assume there's a lot of people that, that would be very eager to have those types of jobs. So I wouldn't undermine the value that the department provides to the community, but I would just, I would just caution you that, that, that if, that if, that if we are going to set these principles and values that, that we, that we get a little bit more explicit with the content that we put in our own in our own um, plans and drafts and whatnot. Um, that was that was that was my only focus. But other than that, I think it's you guys are on it. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Simpson. Are there please, Commissioner Grab? I really like the work that you've done, but I struggle a little bit with the strategic value. And I only say that because after we just got pounded upon to be the board of directors, a lot of what I see is a management focus. And this is the inward look in a lot of cases, not in all cases. I think some of the stuff that Paul brought up and some of the what you brought up at the end, Kelly, with you know where we're going with some of the next steps. We gotta realize we're looking at a strategic business plan and there's two audiences. And I think we're struggling a little bit with that, I think. I think we've got a lot of the management pieces on the front end and looking aspirational, absolutely, that's strategic on what we wanna be, but the inward look on how we get there is a management function. So I, I see that we continue to mix those up. And not that it's a bad thing and we all wanna chase the answer because that's what we do. <laughs> But I, I want us to be careful at this level, be that board of directors, look at what you've all done, and again, it, what you've done is great. It has nothing to do with what I'm saying from this level, because I think it had to be done. And you guys are doing a great job of looking at it. But I think for us, we need to be careful if we're the board of directors, are we being a board here, or are we being your leadership team? So I, I think we're mixing it up a little bit, uh, just as I look at that. 
and and I don't know if this is the perfect forum to have this conversation, but I, I would concur with Commissioner Brown because it's it's almost like we're the we're here as this. I mean, the theme today is Board of Directors Commission, but we're here to develop policy, right? And as a result of that, it's for the director and his team to carry out those outcomes that support those policies, right? Um, I'm I'm curious what. Do, do we have a particular policy or at least uh, benchmarks within those particular policies that we're trying to achieve? And then it's, I would assume, conveyed to the department in itself to execute that, and that's how you guys are measured. Right. right. And I think the question is, are these the areas in which we want to be doing that work? And is this the, this the first strategic business plan for the agency? So is, is this what it should look like? Is this what we should be measuring so that we then are keeping our director accountable to performing on those pieces? Please. And I think with that, for a strategic business plan to work, it's not a five-year plan. It's a 10- to 20-year plan. Uh, and I think we have to, at least the way I look at things, and perhaps others look at it differently, but I think we need to look a little broader. We need to take that leap of looking at diversity from a perspective of 30 years from now, where are you going to get? Who are you relating to? How are we doing this? Uh, we look at our investment piece that Paul spoke of, and I think that was closer to me for being on the strategic level of looking out. We've got to look out beyond kind of this, and, and we're all really much better at one to five years, <laughs> and it's hard. It's hard to get past the five years and into 20 to 30 is like, oh, it's way beyond me. I'm not going to be here. And that's the problem with our group. There's maybe two of you at the table that probably will be here, but maybe not. Uh, you know, it's a few people in the audience that need to provide a little more ex exploration into this planning and strategic planning process. Okay. Uh, I, I think. And again, yeah. that's just me. Well, no, I, I, and I, let's, let's have that discussion because I think the question is, this is meant to add utility to the agency, not be make work just to be able to say we have a document. And so we have a lot of long-term plans, but as we back into these short-term goals, I think that's maybe where it's felt a little bit less um, clear. And so that part... Uh, Kelly, maybe in terms of the utility of this document in, comp mm -hmm. in compilation with all of the other documents that we have, do you mind walking us through that? Okay. Um, I think, you know, it, uh, where when we start off to, we, I think, has some confusion between, like, the transportation plan, which is a 20-year plan, which is really a system plan, and it's a strategic plan for the state and the transportation system. Where we're looking at here is more of our internal, um, how do we be more efficient, more effective, um, what initiatives do we take on over the next, you know, three to five years. And it's meant to be an evolution, and, and really it's a foundation for continuous improvement. Um, so I think they're, they are different purposes, um, but I, I hear what you're saying too about having kind of a long-term vision, a long-term um, strategy that we're working towards that lasts the, the you know test of time to some degree for those of us, and I'm not one of them who will be around that long. So, <laughs> um, but you know, it, I think that's that's really what we're we're talking about is um, how do we internally get focused and um, narrow that um, alignment of our priorities and be more deliberate in in our prior, prioritization process um, for what we're working on. So it's and it's separate from our daily, everyday work to keep the lights on and, you know, keep licenses being issued and, you know, those types of things. Um, so it's really more about our functioning internally and how do we, how do we continuously improve and work on, um, you know, streamlining our technology and our decision making and those types of things, which, which are pretty strategic, um, but it's more internally focused. Thank you. Uh so I, I agree with a lot of the comments here about level, and I think this is a big thing for us right now, uh, as you can tell from my comments so far. Um, I mean, what would make this more, what would make this tie more to what I 
personally view is our role, which is which is at a, an oversight, a higher level, uh, would be if this was tied to kind of the priorities of the agency going forward externally rather than simply internally. And, and, and I think you are, have all been thinking about that, but I, I don't think it's articulated, at least in these slides. So how, if we did all this, how does that help us drive the priorities of the agency and of the state? Just starting with House Bill 2017, you know, how would it help us drive that agenda? Because then it gets more interesting to me as a strategic document because then it ties to, to mission uh, and, and then our, our oversight role uh, comes into play is, is, is this a piece of getting the primary work of the agency done, but in isolation and internally, it feels it feels a little bit more to me like a report to the director than to the board. I mean, it's interesting uh, context, and it's all valuable to learn about. But we have to be, be um, we have to be careful about what we get into and involved in, and what we don't, because we already have a lot to do. So I. I think that for me is where I'm stumbling with this is so how does this relate to what we have to get done over the next six to eight years and I think this morning's conversations were pretty clear about at least major pieces of what that, that is and so if this could tie to that it would be better for for that for our level of analysis does that change a bit about the um, stakeholder engagement in terms of getting to that end that we are achieving? Because I heard it mentioned as a post-engagement, which gives me a little hesitation because it sounds like we're asking a question, but we've already given the answer. Uh, so we may want to rethink that. Uh, maybe we don't go into it today, but we may want to be looking at it a little bit differently in terms of its utility. I mean, I think there are pieces which do. The, the piece Paul was talking about, right. about the longer term planning piece as it connects mm -hmm. between the OTP and the STIP, I think that piece, I think the piece about, you know, have we done an analysis about that, that Commissioner O'Halloran got, got us started talking about, which is, you know, has there been a fatal flaw analysis about what we're up against personnel wise in the next five, six, seven, eight years? Mm -hmm. Those tie. To me, connect more to to have you know, big picture, and we could tie the communication piece that we're doing externally to the internal. I, I think there are pieces there as well. Is that helpful? Okay, all right. Please, I you know one of the fundamental objectives, at least for me, um, is the outcome to prioritize and focus. If you remember some of the critiques that came observations, critiques, you can define them different ways. That this is an agency that is too spread out, trying to be all things to all people. Um, and I think as, as we look at the disciplines that were just articulated, I think the ability for the, the, the commission to say, you know what, these are our priorities, which will then inform our policies, that inform our projects and our programs and the services, and then we're going to measure that to see how you're performing. And depending on that, you'll pivot one way or the other. So my hope is if we can, you know, I would like, I understand the aspirational conversation. I truly do. You've got to reach and you've got to look to the future. And if you're not spending enough time looking to the future, it's upon you and you're flat footed. But we do have the challenge of House Bill 2017, which should be a front and center priority and all those issues, but I would submit to you if you look closely at House Bill 2017, each and every one of those issues, area, those areas that were identified are embedded in that document. So now with that assistance to focus on delivering that, how do we ensure we have the, the resources, be they financial, human, or technical, to deliver on it? And I think that's where we use this board of directors almost as a barometer, right? Is it coming at you? Does it feel right? And if not, then you course correct us and saying this is where we need to go. But my hope is as we continue this discussion to actually bring more focus 
and prioritization so my agencies can better um, utilize its resources here because again I just uh, I was just struck by the affirmation from McKinsey to Pivotal that you try to do too much with the resources that you have and you're spread too thin uh, and you're better than that so somehow bring it on back and I think that's that's where we need to to ensure that our effort is not again displaying out where we want to go, but actually focusing in, which means some difficult decisions internally and externally. So to the point of who do we talk to, we're going to, have to talk to all parts of this conversation because there's a cut line. Mm -hmm. And you're either be above it or below it if we're going to be more disciplined from where we stand right now. So that's kind of the push I'm telling these folks. Be more disciplined. Quit saying yes to every IT project across this agency. Let's prioritize because we don't have enough money mm -hmm. to invest. But where we need it to deliver on the priorities, that's where we need to focus our energies here. The workforce, what are the skill sets that we need? Okay, As we look to the immediate and more importantly the future because with technology coming at us so fast, a different type of skill set is going to be needed. Are we preparing for that? Again, I the puzzle analogy works for me. I think the pieces are out there. We just got to put them together, and make it work. I think it's a. I think it's a good start. I think you have for any large organization, you have to have a strategic plan that should outline a vision, and it may be a little pie in the sky. Um, and I think it's supported by tactical execution, which is a little closer to the ground and a little more tangible. So. I think if if we look at where we were a year ago and and the work that's been done here, I think it's a really good start. And um, I think it'll be easy to shoot holes in it all over the place. But if it mm -hmm. highlights a couple key things that strategically prevent you from doing these tactical executions, it's it's a it's a worthwhile exercise. And and um, I, I just think it's always going to be a little <laughs> aspirational. It's one of those things that's not. I don't think it's a fixed document. I think it's something that you dust off as the agency evolves and as the needs of the state evolve. I think you have to evolve the strategic plan, and I think, but I think it's it's good to have one. Um, it's never going to be perfect and all things to all people, but I think it is fundamentally supported by the pillars of what you're doing, whether it's motor carriers or rail or, what, or highway or whatever division that it's that those tactical day-to-day -day executions of, of how you're running the organization are supported by an overall strategic plan. So I, I think it's a good start. Um, it's not going to be perfect and just accept that and, and that it's going to be a, a, a living document that's going to be tweaked along the way. But I think it's the right direction to go and good to have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Next, we're going to have a discussion, a bit of the follow-up from our roles and responsibilities discussion from the October meeting. And I've abbreviated this just a tad bit because I, I want the commission to know that I think we'll do a deeper dive in December. And so today, we were going to go over some of the themes that we heard and uh, talk about agenda and I think uh, get us ready for what we need to be prepared to discuss in December. So Kelly, I'm going to turn it over to you. and. We'll kick off from there. All right. Sounds good. Thank you, Chair Beeney. Um, Chair Beeney, Commissioners, good afternoon again. This is Kelly Bruce with the Strategic Business Services. And this is um, agenda topic F2, which is the management review implementation on governance clarification um, uh, and um, role clarification. So uh, just to remind you of that management review task, the McKinsey report had identified um, some conflicting messages around the authorities and the roles um, between the commission and the governor's office and the ODOT. And uh, one of their DAS's recommendations was to improve that. Um, and so due to the close ties with the strategic business planning process, we decided to bring our consultant partner, um, Pivotal Resources, in to do a, an assessment with all of you. Um, he met with each one of you and a few others, um, including the governor's liaison, um, and developed a report that you saw last month. And <laughs> last month, we also engaged in a focused workshop um, to start building that understanding around where the confusion may lie, where the points of clarity are, um, and discuss ideas on how to improve. 
So some of the key areas that we talked about were the guide we received guidance and expectations from the governor's office, um, which provided a lot of insight and direction for the commission um, in terms of what she she is hoping to see um, from you. And also um, clarifying and refocusing the commission discussions on policy issues versus management. So we've had a lot of conversation about that today. Um, and we also began talking about the commission's goals and priorities for the next one to three years, which I do think actually would feed into the strategic business planning that we were just talking about. So I think eventually, you know, as we move through this, those things are going to tie together much closer. Um, so today we want to focus on the specific follow-up areas um, from the workshop and then talk about what we want to do um, in December for the next um, discussions. So I'll turn it back over to you, Chair Bainey. Uh, so for today's purposes, I wanted to just reiterate some of the things that I heard and make sure that we were um, addressing some of these right out of the gate. So I heard a lot about the clear communication with OTC staff and the press releases and things that are going on within the agency during the, uh, in between meeting times and really connecting the work that's being done. And I know that that has been uh, already uh, put into our inboxes in terms of what's going on. It's an agency communication, and so I had an opportunity to read that. It's a compilation of the uh, kind of press releases as well as other work that's going on. Uh, we were talking about exercising stewardship that's required in House Bill 2017, and we covered a lot of that this morning in ways in which we're going to be working with that. The confidence and trust, and then tools to assist us with that, the metrics that are necessary for us to measure the work that we are doing and make sure that we are on track as an agency and as a governance body tracking that work as well. Are the delegated systems in place meeting our needs? Do we need to refresh and look at the things that are currently delegated? Uh, given House Bill 2017, I think the answer is yes. And so that is something that we'll bring back next month to take a look at. And I heard a lot about the onboarding or the lack thereof. <laughs> and so Commissioner Van Brocklin, we are, you are our uh, test pilot in terms of seeing how that's going, but uh, we have had a, l a number of changes with the commission over the last handful of years, and uh, a, a bit of that that's not been on our own um, accordance. We've uh, been bumping along a wee bit, and so trying to really strengthen that and make sure that as commission members come on, and to Commissioner Brown as well, uh, we really want to make sure that you have an opportunity to hit the ground running with all the right information. So um, that's something that we're working on as well. So in terms of um, structure for our meetings and getting the right information to commission members to be able to make good informed decisions, uh, with new members coming on and with transitions, the use of links and cover letters, as we heard earlier today, is really critical in terms of that staff report to the information that's being provided, but then also links to the historical ways in which we got to where we are today. JTA is an excellent example, understanding JTA, the um, legal ramifications around that in the statute, and then uh, also what that means to the decisions that are before us. So uh, as I go forward in populating the agenda, as you can see, and Lynn is going to talk about the agenda in particular, but we did an exercise of what is in on the agenda and what is out. And as you can see, really lonely on the right-hand side there is the out category. Um, the in category is uh, very populated with a lot of information. So in December, we will be talking about the ways in which we can focus ourselves in a meaningful way to the work that we need to be doing. So a lot of this, I, as I reviewed it, really comes down to what are we measuring. We have a lot of performance tracking, fiduciary responsibilities. We have condition of the system, systems improvement strategies, a lot of those things that are more metric driven. So I think that'll be helpful. But if we don't want to spend two or three days in a row meeting, we may mm -hmm. want to encourage the in to go to the out and figure out how we coalesce that into meaningful action for the commission. So that's a long way to get to Lynn. I'm going to turn it to you. And a question on this list was, how do we set the agenda and how does that work? And I will tell you as chair, it is a rolling agenda population process. We will talk about certain things in our meetings and those will end up on an agenda. How soon depends on the necessity of it. Uh, part of it is to inform commissioners that are coming on without a backcast of understanding of where we got, you know, how we got to where we are. But I think some of that can be condensed down with using the links and requiring us a bit more 
homework, shall we say, of making sure that we're coming to the meetings, having read all the materials, and uh, up to speed before we get into the meeting. So, please. Thank you, Chair Bainey and Commissioners. I'm Lynn Averbeck, the Interim Commission Manager. And I'm just, I just have one slide to go over today, except it's not showing. It's, it's attachment three in your, there it is, in your packet. Um, so how this works is agenda items are placed on a 12 to 18 month calendar, planning calendar, from all the five sources at the top of that slide there. And then we combine that with monthly, annual, and biennial recurring items that, that we have. A lot of the agenda items come from the OTC's work plan and, and priorities. So the lower section of the graphic between planning calendar and final agenda is an iterative group process. It really is. We kind of go around and around honing it down because we usually start with two, uh, two days worth of stuff <laughs> and have to narrow it down. So what happens is immediately after an OTC meeting, I provide the chair with a draft of the next month's agenda. And then we work with the chair over the next couple of two, three weeks to adjust and refine that until the chair lets us know that it's in final shape. And again, it's just an iterative process up till then. For clarity, and, oh, go, sorry, Lynn. No, I was just gonna say, please ask any questions or comments. Uh, we, I would well, for clarity at that point, just so that you know, I don't have a copy of all of the staff reports and review yeah. all the materials. And uh, what I do look at are things such as timing, uh, good use of our, are we prepping for a decision that's coming before us in a month or two ahead? Are we, um, it, are there deadlines or timelines? Uh, a lot of it, of course, you know, is a stiff process that tends to land on our agendas a lot. Be something that in this new um, framework of the commission that we love to hear about but may not make the list is the immediate opportunity fund. Those are great ways to hear about what's happening within community, but really is that where we should be it's vetted through a lot of process. It's vetted, it's with our partners at Business Oregon. Um, those are the things that we may need to look at taking off our calendar and off our agendas because we do have a policy, we have a process, uh, and we it, is that necessarily governance and, and, and policy setting. So um, some of those things that we love to hear about, if our policies and our, our form follows the function, there are some things that we, we wouldn't be seeing in the future. So please. Oh, please. I guess it, it wouldn't mean that we never hear about it. Oh, the absolutely. director's report saying, hey, we just signed a new Connect Oregon grant for this and it, we're all excited about it. Hopefully that would come from you. you know, I write quite a few memos to city council that aren't going to show up on an agenda, but it's not like I don't communicate with them on what we've done and that I'm excited about it. Just because I'm excited doesn't mean that they are. Right. But I think we would all want to hear what's happening in Canby, what's happening in Burns, uh, places where we don't normally see a $200,000 project, but it's pretty exciting for them. Yes. I would like to know that. And the use of the consent, so if we were to use that visual exactly. again, some of those ins can go to the out, but they're actually on the consent on agenda. Consent, we pull and we, we populate that a little bit more um, aggressively to make good use of our time, but also make sure that we have access to all the information that's happening as well. Commissioner. No, I would just say that, uh, again, as I've, in my time on this commission, I've seen there's been a slow evolution and the stuff that we were squawking about a, you know, a, a year ago, a lot of it we've kind of addressed. Um, I'm listening. Seamless, you know, <laughs> over the course of time and you've been responsive. So I, I think, uh, one, it's good and I think we are kind of trying to get more efficient and, um, I mean, and to the extent that we continue to meet the needs of the state, we're not even obligated to meet every month, right? right? So I, I think it's really about how efficient we are and are we addressing the needs. I think we have a very front-loaded um, agenda right now with the new legislation, and I think as we get into more executing, um, I, I thought that the workshop process was good at just, even if we don't, implement all the changes, it was a good process to air them all. <laughs> and the, the, the grievances and the kind of the things that are annoying or things that we like or whatever, but um, I think it has been a slower evolution, but I think in a positive way, and, and um, I think it was a healthy, healthy process. But um, 
as we get more efficient. And if we're doing our homework, we may be able to do less of the informational and more of the transactional decision-making executing, right. which I think is where, as a commission, we should be. Mm -hmm. um, granted, we need to be informed on stuff, but we can maybe spend less time in the, in the informational side of it and more time in the decision-making part of it and where it's not um, – it's more of a two-way – conversation and that we're making sure we're allowing that that uh, moment that the opportunity to interact all, all the way through but I think it's it, it is evolving in the right direction and I think the process is good excellent and I think the longer that we are a commission and can work and play to our strengths as well that'll really help us uh, move forward so uh, well and now that Bob Van Brocklin's here I think we'll figure it out <laughs> right exactly <laughs> No pressure. <laughs> so, uh, but I do also want to say that I, uh, it, we've been doing a lot of front loading of information to make sure that everyone has the, the right context. But I think a lot of that's going to now have to happen before the meetings. And if we need extra information, that we do that on our own time and that we will abbreviate the PowerPoint presentations and allow us more time for discussion too. So, um, any other, please? So the only the only thing I, I'm still not sure is we've asked for follow-up every now and then. Where does that come? Uh, you know, I don't see that we get that next step. Even if it's a management level follow-up, you know, I still think it was important enough for us to ask for it. Uh, even if it's on consent, we can pull it. But where does that follow-up come? Well, and I think we have not had a um, – it, it's happened vicariously just through some of our meetings, but let's take – so when um, we had asked last month for an um, update on Wikia, not an update, but a follow-up on lessons learned. But I, uh, the director and I have not put together a formalized process of what the timing of that might be. So uh, I will take that on to make sure that we have a, um, if that's the next meeting seems rational, uh, then I'll take that on. Is that what you're getting at? But I think Lynn can help. I don't think it's all upon you to remember everything we asked to follow up. So I oh, think true. as okay. Lynn brings back the, how many items do you say you had on the list from today? Uh, 97 yeah. or oh, something? Oh, right. Okay. But let's, let's make sure that Lynn feeds you, hey, you guys asked for follow up on these and keep a running tab. Very good. And maybe we just check in, is this still valid? Do you still want, does the commission still want that update? Right. Here's another example. Uh, is it Harry Bodine? Is that the gentleman that came and spoke with us about the traffic signal? So I, uh, so it's those that are important. If someone has made time to come and meet in front of the commission and share a story, and I, so this is the process today. I brought the letter, so after the meeting I was going to ask Lynn, did we follow up with Mr. Bodine to find out about the traffic signal? So I think we need to formalize that. Uh, and having dedicated staff is certainly uh, beneficial to be able to offload some of that too. So... Please. Uh, Madam Chair, and, and to Commissioner Brown's question as well, it, it's, it's an excellent question. It is followed up, but it's done in many ways, whether it's, a, uh, again, something we bake into the agenda, whether it's on consent or formal, whether it's uh, embedded in the um, FYI section as a, as a white paper or a, mem uh, a memo, or, or we just delegate out to, hey, Region uh, 1 manager, take care of this situation that came up. But once again, we're kind of spread across yeah, the wind. Right, right. And I think as we have this conversation, tightening it up, how do you want that presented? Do you want it encapsulated in a, in a standalone section um, that articulates, here's what we've done, here's the follow-up, here's, you know, here's the reaction one. It's the way we capture it, because I want to make sure we're capturing it uh, in, in the most useful way for the commission. So there's not a question, did you do it? But I want to make sure when we give it to you, we've packaged it correctly. And that probably stands for the way we package the agenda as a whole. And again, I think um, Commissioner O'Holland spoke to an issue I have. Are we getting the right balance of informational versus uh, transactual or the action items that we would defer? Are we even capturing the, the, the construct of the way we present right? I think we're going to have to walk through that, to be very honest with you. I, we've talked about it. We spoke to it. But I think 
to, to use uh, the, the, the word that I um, heard, or let's be intentional about it. Tell us exactly what you want because we'll, we'll, we'll as an agency, we'll engage and execute that thing uh, exactly the way you want it here. But I want to make sure we're getting the commission that allows for the type of discourse during, in between uh, the meetings as well because sometimes it preps for the next conversation and we use those informational uh, presentations to do just that, to tee up the next conversation. Hopefully that's helpful, but if it's not scratching the itch, scratching the itch mm -hmm. right, let's, Let you know. let's have yeah. that chat. Excellent. Okay, are there questions? So this really is a prep for next month. Uh, we will work yeah. offline to find out the right amount of time to do that. Uh, and do you, did you get what you needed yeah. from us? Okay, Thank excellent. You. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> Okay, got it. All right, so uh, let's go on to engaging in a discussion on, um, and let's see, shall we go? I think I'm gonna take it a little bit out of order. Uh, yeah, okay, all right. Travis and I are trying to read each other's mind here and it's not going very well in case you're wondering what's going on. <laughs> Uh, my apologies. Okay, so let's go on to uh, the request of approval on the transparency and decision-making communication plan and acceptance of the management review implementation monthly progress report. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you. So uh, Chair Bainey and Commissioner, my name is Kelly Bruce um, again, and I am here with Tom Fuller. Um, this is our wrap-up for the first uh, item on the desk management review in terms of deadlines. So uh, the communication plan, and I think we can be very brief um, in, in the idea of catching up, so. Thank you, Kelly, and uh, Madam Chair, members of the commission, again, my name is Tom Fuller, communication section manager for the Oregon Department of Transportation, and I'm here to bring you what I hope will be a final version of the uh, transparency and decision-making plan um, again, the McKinsey report and the DAS recommendations gave high marks to ODOT communications as a whole, but how we engage our public stakeholders is something that we could see improvement on. We brought a plan to you last month, got some direction from you. What I added to the plan that you have in front of you are uh, more tactics. We, we got more specific about what we're going to do and how we're going to measure whether our plan is a success. And uh, Commissioner Brown asked us, uh, to go out to some of the, the uh, area commissions on transportation and get their input, which just made too much sense, I must say, uh, since they're the audience group that we were really trying to improve communications with. Um, and so I received uh, three communications back from uh, ACT chairs, and uh, the areas where the plan was edited or um, changed because of, maybe we should, getting some feedback, sorry, the technical me is coming out. Um, where we made some changes in the plan are um, on page five, where we talk about um, staff members who engage with the ACTS and the Metropolitan Planning Organizations will provide more time for ACT review of specific areas um, of uh, decisions that the, uh, that the agency needs to make. And then uh, the second change that we made was the addition of a bullet where we will look for more meaningful ways of leveraging intersecting investment opportunities. And that was specific language that came from one of the, the ACT chairs. And then the second place where we edited the plan was in adding a section called improving the plan, because that was the second thing that the uh, ACT chairs uh, gave to us as, as far as recommendations, and that is doing some periodic surveys of our acts and ask them how are we doing with the plan and how can we improve in our uh, transparency in decision making. So those are my updates. Glad to ask any questions and then hope that we can uh, gain approval. Well, I would just say thank you to Commissioner Brown for that recommendation. I think it bared the fruit that we were hoping to, to garner. So are there comments or questions on this? Okay. Please. Real quick, Tom. So this isn't, again, this isn't the one and done like we've talked about before. These, you'll continue to make improvements, get feedback, and provide updates to everybody as you change things? Right. Uh, and Commissioner Brown, uh, our, our direction really is going to be take this plan out, um, have our area managers and work with the ACT chairs, and we need to try it on to see how exactly it fits. 
and where there are edges that rub, then we'll want to make changes, I think, on a continual, ongoing basis. Um, we have to get approval of the plan because that was what we were directed to do, but by no means does it mean we're done with planning and changing and improving. Commission needs to formally accept this plan, and then we also have the update on the management review. So let's take the, man the uh, communications plan first. I would welcome a motion if we feel ready to approve that. Uh, Madam Chair, I uh, request that we first accept and then approve the uh, transparency and decision-making communication plan um, of the transportation management review implementation and the implementation monthly report. I hope I got all that right. Uh, okay. Did I get that right? Close enough? Uh, roll them together. Okay. Is okay. it two? Do we need them separate, or are we are? Well, we haven't really received. Um, do you have? You do have an update? A short. It, it's just a very brief update. I mean, we've pretty much covered some of the big ones: the communication plan, the strategic business plan, um, the governance piece. So we've talked about those three. So it'd be a matter of if the commission has questions about any of the other items that are on the progress report. Okay. So I would just. Uh, how okay. about? I, I'll Maybe accept clarify. your. Well, I'll accept your motion, but then I'll okay. ask if there are other. Uh, questions or comments, and if it's a comment in reference to uh, clarity or edits or um, any input into the management progress report for this month? Nothing? Okay. So all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's okay. That's all right. She, she'll get it. Yes. Not a problem. Okay. So now we have a presentation on... Uh, get to the right why am i Down at the bottom. oh yeah i think we're going to move the move this around a little bit so we're going to take the request for an approval of a type b immediate opportunity fund grant in the amount of one hundred and thirty seven thousand nine hundred fifty one dollars the city of canby to reconstruct an intersection for better truck turning access so mr winchheimer the floor is yours good afternoon uh Chair Bainey, members of the commission, I'm Ryan Winsharmer. I'm the ODOT Region 1 manager. And as you describe, I'm here today to talk about uh, a Type B immediate opportunity fund for approximately $138,000 to the city of Canby. They have um, an industrial area that has very difficult access off of Highway 99, and uh, trucks are uh, having to cross into oncoming lanes, and they're going over the curbs as they're trying to access this park, uh, which is really a job center for the community. These improvements will help correct those deficiencies, improve safety, and obviously hopefully help keep the jobs uh, in the industrial area. Um, I'm joined up here this, this afternoon by uh, Business Oregon, by the Canby Economic Development Director, and by a developer who's taking this opportunity to leverage uh, a really important development for the city of Canby, and so I'd like to turn it over to them to tell you a little bit more about those. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the Commission. My name is Brian Guinea. I'm the Regional Development Officer for Business Oregon for the Portland metro area, uh, Clackamas, Multnomah, Washington County. Uh, Business Oregon has evaluated this project. Uh, pleased to bring it to your behalf uh, with the City of Canby uh, for the improvements in safety, transportation access, and the impact, immediate impact on jobs and economic development for the City of Canby and the region. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to the City of Canby. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Please. There we go. Oh, there you are. Oh. I like to move that we have order new mics. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Um, First one. We do this every meeting. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the commission. Appreciate your taking time to hear this um, project today. My name is Renata Mengelberg. I'm the Economic Development Director for the City of Canby. And I'm here to say we're very excited about this project and, and hope that you'll support it. Um, it's a relatively modest project. We're asking for 137951 We have 50% uh, matching funds already allocated, and we're ready to go as soon as you are, ready to partner with the ODOT team to implement this improvement right away. Um, it's very critical to our um, Northwest Industrial Park, which is home to three of our largest employers. Altogether, um, it represents 600 jobs to the community, 
and there are 120 trucks a day that go through this inter intersection. It's very dangerous, and um, what we're finding is that trucks are avoiding this intersection and going through um, by a high school to be able to hit it head on instead of trying to make the turn. If you were out, the day, out there today, you would see um, truck marks well into the sidewalk going over the ADA ramp and into the landscaping area to be able to make the turn. And that happens on a daily basis. So it's a very dangerous intersection. It's a very important truck route for us. And that's why we're encouraging your approval. Um, it's also important to the establishment of a quiet zone for the community, which is something that we've wanted for a lot of years. Um, that would um, eliminate the trains um, honking their horns at three different intersections through our downtown that's really affecting the livability and the business climate there. And um, having this improvement in place means that we could move ahead with that project as well, which has already been approved by the National Railroad Association and through all of the approval process that are needed. We just need to fix this and then we're good to go. So anyway, with all of that, I really encourage you to support this project and look forward to partnering with your team to make it happen. Thank you. So I noted in the packet it talks 30 trains per day That's run right. through Canby. And That's if right. they're blowing their whistle at three different stops, oh my word, okay. It's, it's, definitely, it's, a, it's definitely a conversation stopper. You can't hear yourself absolutely, think. Absolutely, absolutely. Please. My name is Mary Hanlon. I'm with Hanlon Development. And we entered into negotiations with the city of Gamby in 2015 to redevelop their downtown historic core. And uh, we're building 70 apartment units and then um, uh, renovating two historic buildings and putting ground to floor commercial. And then there's a fourth building that will have commercial as well. And as you just noted, it's, it's, we, we, we entered into these agreements with an understanding that there was going to be a quiet zone. And so when it, what hadn't, been, it hadn't happened, I've been sort of researching it. It sounds like there was some miscommunication a few years ago, so this will remedy some problem with expectations between what the city was expecting and what the state was going to provide. So it's really about creating a safety corridor right at that one intersection, and that'll eliminate the horns blasting their horns as you go through. It goes right by the site. It's about 50 yards, so people won't be able to sleep at night. And, uh, you know, when you compare it to something like the city of Newburgh that's having kind of a revitalization of their downtown, they're having to move a whole highway outside of all this is doing needs is a fix in one intersection, and the downtown can be successfully redeveloped. We're putting, there's over $13 million of private money going into this one block and over $2 million of public money going into the block and it's absolutely essential. Uh, it's like the number one priority right now, so. Excellent. Thanks. Okay, questions or comments? I don't know, there's, it just seems like such a softball, right? It, <laughs> it seems like such an easy yeah. one to do. A lot of benefit for uh, not a lot of money comparatively. You bet. And um, it, it seems like you guys all have skin in the game and put a lot of thought into it. Anyway, I think it's, it seems, it feels easy compared okay. to some of the other ones we've had to chew on recently. But so anyway. that sounds like a motion. Uh, well, <laughs> unless there is other discussion, I'll just I'll just roll right into it and uh, request the approval of the Type B Immediate Opportunity Fund grant in the amount of one hundred thirty-seven thousand nine hundred fifty-one dollars to the City of Canby for the purpose of reconstructing an intersection for better truck turning access. Excellent. Do we have further comments or questions? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries. Well Hallelujah. done. Hallelujah. Yay. Thank, thank, thank you. you so much. Very much yes. appreciate it. You bet. And thank you for the partnership with Business Oregon. Okay. Now let's go on for to item G. Receive a presentation and provide direction on a final funding allocation for 21-24 STIP. And Mr. Brower, Ms. Bohart, and Mr. Mather. <laughs> I know. Okay, we're back. Um, this is uh, the STIP crew here to walk, continue to walk you through our monthly um, uh, development of the 21-24 uh, STIP 
Paul Mather, Highway Division Administrator. I'm going to get us kicked off here and give a little bit of background, but I'm going to immediately apologize to our newest commissioner. This has been an ongoing discussion that we've really do uh, dove deep in many different areas. And, and as you'll see as the conversation goes forward, there's some decisions or, or strong guidance that we've gotten to develop these recommendations. We'll try to give you as much background as we go, but uh, please ask questions um, to help uh, get you up to speed on where we where we are. So this is our, the STIP is our capital construction program. All our federal funds are in here. Um, this is uh, really when people think of the highway division anyway, or the Department of Transportation, our investment, it's really uh, the STIP is where uh, people, people think about. One of the first things we did um, is talk about the categories that we're going to divide the funds um, into. Uh, we've made a, a couple of switches from um, the, the previous step that was uh, just approved last last July, and so these are just as a reminder the categories that we've been moving forward with. As we develop scenarios, we put uh, funding into those various categories of projects, and we were asked to overlay the uh, House Bill 2017 funds into those categories, so you can see more fully um, your decisions with the uh, existing state and federal funds. Um, what the fuller picture looks like as we look at the, uh, the uh, various categories. Uh, so where we are now, we've kind of grayed out the ones that you uh, really don't have, you don't have control over or you've made decisions on. So obviously the House Bill uh, 2017 funds were um, prescribed to go in, in certain areas um, as well as other decisions that we've made along the way. The really the focus of this conversation is that um, kind of big fundamental decision between taking care of the system versus enhancing the system or fixing fix it versus enhance um, is really that policy decision that we're that we're looking for from the from the commission. Last month we were in front of you with three different scenarios. Uh, based on your guidance, we've dropped the the third scenario and, and we'll continue to focus on uh, scenario one and two as we uh, bring forward our, our recommendation uh, today. So this slide is just to remind you of, of that conversation from, from last month. So just uh, some further context slides for you. I showed you the uh, House Bill 2017 funds in the various categories. Uh, here's what that, uh, those funds look like in total, not just the, the amount of money that's in the STIP. So you have maintenance and small city allotment, rest areas, some of the you know, debt service funds that don't actually show up in the STIP. This is, um, um, from a highway standpoint, a more holistic view of all the funds that are in uh, 2017. Uh, these next two slides I uh, continue to uh, remind you of as we look at the condition of the system or we uh, kind of pivot off of that uh, fix it side of, uh, side of the equation. Uh, the, again, the three lines on here, the status quo is based on our um, past steps without House Bill 2017, what our um, uh, bridge conditions would look like. And so as you go up the graph, that's an increase in poor uh, condition of just the bridges on our critical routes. Um, as you remember in my previous presentations, this looks a lot worse. If you look at all our bridges, these are the bridges on the interstate and our major freight routes um, is what this represents represents. This, the green line on here is House Bill 2017. House Bill 2017 was built on scenario two, and that is the assumption that we continue to fund uh, the fix-it uh, program uh, that we've historically fund uh, rolls, rolls forward. So as you move towards scenario one, um, the condition on the green line moves um, up towards the status quo line or the conditions uh, get worse. Uh, the difference between scenario one and two from a bridge standpoint means um, about 10 to 15 bridge projects during the life of this STIP. Um, it also means our inability to focus on our, some of our vulnerable timber bridges that we have. And some of those um, are in rural areas, but also some mo notable ones as you go on Barber Boulevard maybe in drive on, uh, on the interstate and you look at Vermont um, and I forget the other cross street viaduct there, but you'll see some large timber structures that are some of our vulnerable ones that we would be able to uh, to get to. The, the last line on here, the gold line is our investment strategy. I referenced earlier presentation. Uh, this was the desired state that the commission approved on about a year ago. 
um, in our investment strategy. So just give you some reference points there. So here's the same slide again on the pavement side. Um, investment strategy, in this, in this case, the graph is flipped over. So as you go down, the pavement conditions get worse. Um, the investment strategy there is on top, status quo is a red line. And then again, the green line there in the center, uh, House Bill 2017 is um, built upon scenario two. Um, in this case, if we moved from scenario two to scenario one, it would mean about 150 lane miles of roadway that would not be addressed. Um, just in that shift from scenario two to one, it would mean um, about a 5% decrease in condition level in our urban um, part of our system. The majority of the, the funds that we would be talking about, um, the difference between scenario one and two would be focused on our uh, urban routes, uh, would also have an impact on our, on our um, ADA ramps and our um, addressing and our commitments there in that many of those urban paving projects that would not be funded um, would trigger and thus um, move us further on the ADA. So anyway, so just to give you a, uh, a little bit of flavor of the differences and some of the nuances between uh, scenario one and two um, as we look at pavements and bridges from a fix it standpoint. I'm gonna turn it over to Travis. Madam Chair, members of the commission, for the record, I'm Travis Brower, ODOT's assistant director. And uh, Paul started walking you through the considerations around the, the different scenarios and gave you two of the reasons uh, that we had put together scenarios that focused uh, largely on fix it, particularly around legislative intent and then the ongoing decline of the transportation system that we see uh, regardless of scenario. And then I'm gonna walk you through a couple more reasons that pushed us, uh, some of those factors that pushed us toward a fix it investment, and then also talk about some other factors that push you toward investing in the enhanced highway side. So to start with, uh, the first area that pushes us toward a fix it investment again is public opinion. What we've seen consistently across all of the surveys we've ever done is that there is nearly unanimous support for a focus on maintaining existing roads. We do a biennial transportation needs and issues survey, and we ask this question consistently. The fix it is always at the very top of that list, followed always by safety. So there's unanimous support. This uh, STIP cycle is part of our transparency and openness uh, uh, push, we did also a STIP survey of the public, had over 1,700 people respond, and again, you saw that near unanimous support for a focus on maintenance uh, of the system and, and safety. The uh, reducing traffic congestion, expanding, improving roads, also a priority uh, in our uh, TNIS, uh, not nearly as much in the STIP survey, but lower than safety and preservation. You'll recall we talked about doing a uh, online open house for this STIP uh, that put out for public comment the uh, framework that we had developed uh, with you. And we had over 200 people that responded to this. Uh, what we found again was of those people, fix it was by far the top priority. 90% said it was most important or very important. Safety was right behind it. And then the other programs, local government, non-highway enhance, uh, still strongly supported, but in a much lower uh, level of support for those. Similarly, we put the three scenarios that we had brought before the commission last month out to the public, and of the people who responded to those, 30% uh, chose scenario one, which had the higher level of uh, enhanced highway funding. 70% chose either scenario two or scenario three, which were the, the lower levels of enhanced highway funding. One of the other, and I think, to be honest, probably the most important scenario or factor that pushed us toward an investment in fix it is the policies that have been adopted by the commission over time. And when I say the commission, I don't mean the five members in front of us today, but the entirety of the commission that is there on the wall with the, uh, the Oregon Transportation Plan adopted in 2006 is a strongly fix it oriented document. Uh, it and the Oregon Highway Plan really prioritized preservation of assets. Key initiative A, and it's A because it was sort of the top key initiative, is that we will maintain the existing transportation system to maximize the value of the assets. If funds are not available to maintain the system, develop a triage method for investing available funds. So this is the adopted direction of this Transportation Commission and the, the commissions that come before you, which again is where we come from as an agency and that push toward fix it. So those are a couple factors that definitely push uh, toward a strong investment in maintaining and preserving the system. But there are certainly others on the side that pushes you toward investing in, in the enhanced 
uh, enough highways. So we all know that congestion in Portland is getting bad. From 2013 to 2015, the uh, total hours of congestion in the metro region increased 13.6% in just two years. Similarly, over that two-year period, uh, daily vehicle hours of delay increased by almost 23%. When we look from a freight mobility standpoint, what you see, uh, this was the bottleneck analysis done for the Oregon Freight Plan uh, update that you're going to get a little bit later. By far and away, the worst freight mobility challenges in the state are in the Portland metro region. Essentially, the entire I-5 corridor is blinking red at this point, and much of the I-205 corridor as well. So those are the top priorities statewide. Uh, and that is, as you've heard uh, repeatedly, having an increasing impact on the entire state's economy as people from across Oregon, uh, businesses are finding it hard to move their goods from their farms and forests and factories to those national and international markets that are largely accessed through the Portland metro region. So again, that pushes you towards some investment in uh, expanding highways. Now. Then again, yeah, when considering that need for enhancing the system, uh, remember that the legislature in HB 2017 put uh, the technical term is a boatload of money into those enhancement projects, $672 million directed to specific modernization projects in the 21 to 24 step period uh, by HB 2017. So I-5 of the Rose Quarter, Oregon 217 auxiliary lanes, and a couple of projects on I-205. But that's not the only projects we have planned that will improve uh, reliability and reduce congestion in the Portland metro region. There are others that have been funded in the STIP uh, that you can see on this project, both uh, auxiliary lane projects, uh, you know, for example, one that we've talked with you about before is I-5 southbound from Boone's Ferry to I-205 will add an auxiliary lane at that section where traffic gets gummed up by 217 emptying onto the freeway. Also, uh, Region 1 has found some funding for a couple of auxiliary lanes on I-205, both, both north of I-84 and southbound from I-84, uh, as well as some of our uh, high-tech, real-time automated or active traffic management projects that uh, help improve safety and reliability on the system. So you can see there are a significant number of projects that will help improve traffic flow within the Portland metro region that are already funded, regardless of what you do in the STIP. But what we heard from you last month was uh, an interest in exploring ways to target additional investments to congestion relief. And so we put our heads together and tried to figure out within this framework, uh, given the strong fix-it orientation we have, how could we go about doing that? So here's what we'd like to bring back to you for your comment. Uh, this chart shows our assumptions around federal funding. And as we've talked with the commission over time, there's a lot of uncertainty at the federal level. The FAST Act expires in 2020, and we don't know what the heck will happen after that. What we saw after the expiration of Safety Lou, as you can see, that expired in 2009, and for years, funding was flat or declining. In fact, this is the first year we're going to top our level of funding in 2018, not in real terms. If you factor in inflation, we're still well behind. But uh, federal tra surface transportation funding was actually fell by a bit. So we build into our STIP assumptions that after the FAST Act expires, funding will fall by 10%. And that's a prudent risk management tactic because we don't really want to go design a bunch of projects and then have to pull them back. We did that back in 2007, and it was probably one of the more painful things the Commission has, has done in recent years. Uh, so instead we say, okay, let's just assume there a little bit less federal funding comes in and we'll build a shelf of fix-it projects. It's really easy to get those pavement and bridge projects out the door uh, when additional funding comes in. So the scenarios one and two that we presented to you earlier uh, last month assume that funding falls and that any additional funding comes in would be used to plus up the fix-it side of the house. What we wanted to present to you is a slight variation on that, what we're calling Scenario 2 Plus, uh, because it takes Scenario 2 and then looks for an opportunity to plus up the uh, uh, enhanced highway side a little bit uh, with some additional federal money. So what we would do here is we would take uh, up to $40 million in any additional federal funding that comes in over and above our assumption of a slight cut and put that into a strategic investment program. You'll recall in the 2018 to 2021 step, the commission set aside $50 million 
uh, as a fund for strategic investments that could be made to target particular needs on the state highway system. Most likely right now you'd be looking at some form of congestion relief, but we would come back to the commission at a later date uh, to work through exactly what that would look like. Uh, you know, there might be opportunities to leverage federal grants, having that money available, uh, or to add features onto projects that we're already undertaking. We would work with the commission to figure out exactly what that would be. But we wouldn't recommend, because this, we're recommending this be conditional upon actually getting the money in the door, we wouldn't recommend putting that out to the acts and having them select projects only then to have to potentially pull those back if the federal money does not materialize. So we would recommend giving that to the commission uh, for a, a allocating at a later date based on criteria that you develop slightly further down this process. We'd wait a little while, see if the federal money comes in, schedule those projects for the end of the STIP uh, so that we wouldn't be putting a lot of money into development before we knew what was really going forward. I would note that uh, if you accept this scenario 2 plus or give us other uh, direction, what you'll see is that fix it funding will go from about, or sorry, enhanced highway funding will go from about $124 million in the 2018 21 STIP uh, to over $700 million in the 2021 24 STIP. That's a six fold increase in the enhanced highway funding. So that is a fairly robust level of funding uh, and a, a greater level of parity between these two categories than we've seen in recent steps. So with that, I will pause, and this would be a perfect time for any feedback you have about whether this is scratching your itch. Thank you for taking our comments and rolling them into a two plus. I, I like what we've presented here. Do we have comments? Is this what we're hoping for? Please. So, so Enhance is going up over current as a as a percentage of overall funding, or I mean, is it, I know it's going up dollar wise, mm -hmm. but for the for the overall package, is the percentage of allocation changing? Yeah, Commissioner O'Holler, and it would go up substantially. Uh, we have not run those figures as to what it would be compared to the last round, but given how much the legislature automatically put into Enhanced Highway, uh, when you show the full picture of all that funding, it goes up both in absolute terms, like I said, about six times what was in the last dip, but also as a percentage of funding, it is much higher. So, and if we extract the three projects or whatever the big projects were that mm -hmm. were earmarked in the, in the bill, um, does do we still have additional an increased percentage for enhance uh, out of the funding, Commissioner O'Halloran? If you took those projects out, you would probably, with this scenario, be relatively close to the split you had in the last round. If you also then took off the fix it money from HB twenty seventeen that the legislature specifically directed, so you're among your discretionary resources. You're probably a little higher on the fix it side. Uh, but that sort of balances out that big infusion of funding from the legislature, which was the direction the, the commission asked us, I think in September, show the whole picture of all the funds coming in, both discretionary and uh, mandatory. Yeah, and I appreciate it, and I appreciate, the I, I appreciate the polling work as well, but I guarantee you from the people I survey, everyone says enhance, you gotta do, <laughs> because, because congestion just doesn't get addressed without enhance and and I don't know how many of you have the opportunity to drive 26 going toward 405 in the morning um, but it backs up to Hillsboro um, and, and so and I realize that some of this is outside maybe outside the scope but I think we have to look at some some other stuff and I don't even think it's a tunnel issue I think that I've been talking to Ryan about kind of some of the planning and some of the other stuff but I think um, enhance has to consider it. We have to con continue to focus on it if we're going to address address congestion. And so, um, I appreciate that, and uh, may want to go through the numbers a little a little more closely. But I appreciate the fact that the numbers tilt in that direction. Yeah, and Commissioner Holland, I can uh, reinforce. So when we actually did a regional breakdown with our uh, public opinion research. And what we found, it was interesting, in the Portland metro region, still most people actually say uh, preservation of the system and maintaining it, but it's a lot closer than it is in the rest of the state. And that mix is definitely moving toward addressing congestion in the last round of survey that we did. Yeah, thank you. Please. So given the House Bill 2017 numbers and you know, huge infusion, as you already alluded to, 
if we do a two plus scenario, will it allow us to leverage the enhanced dollars? That was one thing that we talked quite a bit about last time and at our workshop is how do we leverage those? How do we, for instance, go back to Leanne's comments this morning with safe routes to school? There may be a way to mm -hmm. add just a little bit more and would this scenario allow us to do that? Commissioner Brown, uh, absolutely. That was one of the key features, and uh, Jerry in her wrap-up will, will sort of lay out the totality of those programs. Uh, what we proposed last month was that, that uh, I guess it's orange slice that's labeled Federal Enhance, would go out to the ACTS as a leverage program, uh, one of three that we, we would recommend, where the ACTS would be given the ability to use those funding sources to add features to fix it projects uh, that would sort of maximize the ability to leverage those funds uh, it would provide a more comprehensive solution in a community than you would be if you were just paving uh, through a community or, or just fixing a bridge. And certainly there are opportunities in these other programs as well, Safe Routes to School being a key one, as much funding, I think there's 37.5 million for Safe Routes to School in this STIP. And we absolutely are going to be looking for every opportunity we have to leverage that with other projects. Because what we see with, say, an, an ADA ramp, those are really expensive if you do them standalone. But if you can do an ADA ramp combined with uh, sidewalks, combined with paving or a safety project, you might be able to get some efficiencies and economies of scale. So with your, so that's the orange line. Mm -hmm. That gets us the, the plus on some of the other projects. Yep. The yellow piece is, we'll hold it and see what we got. I mean, that's basically what this two plus is saying. Yep, Commissioner Brown, that we allow the commission to define the program design and the criteria uh, as we get a little bit further into this process, uh, and you could determine, uh, you know, whether it was something you wanted to use for leveraging in other places. What we held back last time around the fifty million dollars, we said one of the criteria would be to try to leverage federal funds, give us an opportunity to have some money in the bank when there's a federal grant that comes in, and say the there's something called the infra grants, which are the for the freight mobility projects. If we had a little bit of money that was ready in the STIP, we could go use that to try to leverage, say, 50 to $100 million in, in federal funds. That might be one approach. Uh, there might be something else as well that we could look at for that funding. Last time you actually ended up in the 1821 STIP using that money for freight mobility enhancements because the primary source of that funding was actually the new federal freight funds. Please. So uh, we received a couple of letters, one from Metro and another from the Public Transit Advisory Committee mm -hmm. relative to this plan. Have you looked at them? Commissioner Van Brocklin, yes. We have looked at those and tried to find ways uh, to address the, the desire, particularly from our partners in Region 1. Uh, you also have a letter from the Region 1 Act to try to plus up that enhanced number without reducing that amount of money for fix it uh, that the legislature uh, really assumed uh, as part of their intent in the legislation. And Jerry, as for the letter from uh, the Public Transit Advisory Committee, Jerry's going to get into that in just a, a moment and talk okay. about that. But essentially, it's our feeling that we would be walking away from what the commitments were made in House Bill 2017 if we moved that dial a little bit more. So our opportunities are more leveraging the federal side to get more enhanced drawn into the state. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, Commissioner, that, that's okay. correct. I mean, certainly the commission has it within its purview to, to modify that. Uh, and yet, you'd, you'd have to have some conversations with legislators before we would recommend doing that. And I, I can't tell you what direction that conversation would go because they were obviously very supportive of maintenance and preservation and we're building their investment levels on top of an assumption of what the commission would continue to do in the STIP. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Okay, non-highway. All right, non-highway. Um, for the record, uh, Jerry Bohard, Transportation Development Division <laughs> Administrator, and I'm just going to run through um, the non-highway portion of the discussion. So um, again, just a little bit of a reminder of the areas that we're talking about, that um, the funds that exist in the STIP. So for instance, public transportation, the 43 million is essentially um, 
uh, 36 million going to elderly and disabled and the rest going to mass transit and um, uh, Com uh, Commissioner Van Brocken. So uh, we do have two million a year that goes into mass transit. It is for those um, um, transit providers that actually can have sort of a uh, direct FTA funds. So it goes to folks like TriMet, Salem, uh, Lane, um, uh, Rogue Valley, Corvallis. So it doesn't get to all of our providers, but we do have money that goes into bus replacement. Um, really the 15 million that the commission set aside um, for the first time in the 1821 stip was um, for those buses in which um, our division or our agency holds title to. So in a way the monies go uh, to different purposes. I think the other rationale, and I'll get into the slide in a minute, is that um, as you heard through Haspel 2017, I think uh, Leah Horner talking about the stiff funds and sort of recognizing that capital is an opportunity for um, so purchasing of buses can be used through some of the house bill um, funds. So again, sort of recognizing there's never enough money for everything that um, we need to accomplish. So as uh, Travis mentioned, so the 60 million, essentially a, a little over uh, 35, uh, 37 million is from safe routes from the house bill. And then the 1% um, is for the bicycle and pedestrian program. And then the non-highway 51 million is sort of our state and um, federal um, requirements that we have and it's really the 51 million um, that you have uh, discretion and so um, this um, um, pie chart looks the same as uh, what we shared with you last month we um, heard from you sort of a uh, we seem to be heading in the right direction so I think we talked a little bit about the 21 million so that's really that opportunity to sort of leverage the fix it projects um, the 18 million sort of a recognition since the last dip um, we've had the um, settlement agreement. Um, we've had our transition plan right around ADA, so sort of recognizing that we have to make a commitment there. Um, and then I think you've seen a couple of letters really um, in support of um, increasing the safe routes to school education. And so this would be essentially uh, doubling that. Um, what was uh, currently in um, the safety division, Troy Costales' budget, um, to do the outreach and the planning that we need to do that really supports the infrastructure um, program that is funded through uh, House Bill um, 2017. So again, so not a whole lot of changes to um, uh, the, the non-highway. So this really gets to what our recommendation is around, so we refer to it as scenario two plus. I think the important point, because um, one of the other criteria that you all had was really about how do we keep the acts engaged in the conversation. Um, and so the active transportation leverage, the safety leverage, and the statewide highway leverage would be really those opportunities um, for the acts to engage with our regions um, relative to how do you sort of take advantage and leverage those fix-it projects as they come forward. I think that you heard Travis talk really about that the strategic investment conversation um, would be really the responsibility of the commission um, <coughs> should we see those uh, additional funds. So. That's really just sort of, um, as we went through this presentation, providing you with um, our recommendations. I think the important thing to note is just sort of the, the next step. So uh, I think we're hoping that we can um, finalize this um, in December. Um, and I think also just the recognition as we went through this, that we still have some more information that we need to share with you. So we've talked about um, active transportation uh, leverage, safety leverage, uh, the strategic um, um, investments in the statewide leverage, we recognize that we need to bring you what we envision being the guidance relative to that. So the framework for how our regions will have the discussion um, and what the process will look like uh, relative to that. So we know we have some more homework uh, to do mm -hmm. there. We envision bringing that um, back to you in March. Um, what I really just want to take a second and draw your attention to is that you have two documents in, in your um, attachments to your staff reports. One is this table. And one is this, these definitions. So ultimately, really, when we come back to you um, in December for your approval, we really will be looking for an approval of a table that looks like this. Right now, this has scenario one and scenario two. So we'd obviously be identifying which one or something in between that. Um, but it just really highlights all the other things that you're approving, whether it's the amount of funds going to the immediate opportunity program, which you heard a project about just earlier, or some of the pass-through funds that go 
um, to our metropolitan planning organization. So just, just sort of a reminder that there's a couple other uh, numbers that are here, and that's really the table that you will um, be gaveling down on. And so I think I'll just close, though, um, and sort of remind you that um, the program allocations, obviously really key to um, working on the STIP, but there's a lot more pieces that actually go into it um, before we actually come to you um, in June of 2020, which is a few years down the road, um, where we actually look for the approval for the 21-24 STIP. So this is just really setting the stage, obviously really important, but just setting the stage. So anything I missed that you guys would add? Okay. I have a, a quick question, and I appreciate. So when we met with the ACT chairs, there was a lot around leverage. There was a lot around flexibility. I'm hearing those themes come out, so I really appreciate that we're taking those things. We heard IOF. We heard um, you know, safety, of course. But we heard a lot about buses, and I we have another letter about buses. So could you, and I know you said it, but maybe it's just the, uh, for me, if I need to replace a bus in this dip, what is, what is accessible uh, to an organization? Is that too simplistic of a way to ask no. it? But I, uh, I, I get asked apparently this bus situation and the changes that could or may happen or may not uh, is creating some angst. Um, so, uh, Commissioner Bainey, so within the two million a year that's in the STIP, so the six million, um, some of our larger transit providers um, actually submit to our um, uh, rail and public transit division. <laughs> Um, I know last time when they selected it, they um, really had a, re we were able to fund uh, 10 of the buses that were requested um, versus the 27 that were asked for. And it's a competitive process. And it's a competitive and it's process. A, okay. And I can't get too much into the particulars. I'd have to That's just defer fine. to to, um, to how. Now, I, I will tell you sort of the recognition that um, it, that without the 15 million, um, HowGuard did do um, some work sort of looking at, you know, if you think about some of the charts that, that Paul does relative to what happens to um, the condition, um, you do see a reduction um, in the asset condition of our bus system of about, about 8% by not keeping up with the 15 million a year. Okay. Now, that's making the assumption that um, the uh, providers wouldn't use part of their stiff funds to also, also do bus replacement. So he just he just basically looked at if there was no $15 million, what would that do to our asset condition? But again, they have, it is allowed use within the new funds in House Bill 2017. Okay, very good. And with those funds, it's also possible, I know for my own area, to leverage more federal funds coming into your own community. So there could be an enhanced way, and I don't know if those are for expansion of service directly or could be used for that capital, but um, I get I get the angst. It's my understanding that many of the buses were purchased in 2008. Is that yeah? They were part so of, and I'm going to forget what the acronym stands for, but part of the ARA funds. And <laughs> so the uh, lifespan of some of that uh, inventory is coming to an end. So I, I just want for those that are concerned about that, it's I want to make mm -hmm. sure that we're clear on some of those challenges that'll be in front of us. Yeah, Chair Bainey, for context, that was exactly what happened. The Recovery Act came in 2009 and provided a massive infusion. In, uh, that had to go into transit capital, could not be used for transit operations. So at that point, a, a, another boatload of buses were purchased. And the reason the commission chose to put additional money into the 1821 STIP was because those buses were then at the end of their life needing replacement. Uh, and so it was considered at the time by the commission, uh, I won't say a one-time investment, but there was n in that discussion, no ongoing commitment. It was to address that specific issue at that point in time. Thank you for that. Please, Commissioner Brown. So I hate to bring up a weird subject, but CMAX in your, oh, in my your favorite other, subject. I know it's your favorite, but <laughs> is that in your, the chart that you talked about, Jerry? Uh, yes, it is, okay. Commissioner. I figured it would be. And then um, if, if we go through, and I know we're not making all the decisions, but I won't be here in December. I think, Travis, to your, to the 50 million, if we carve, or 40 million, whatever it turns out to be, if we carve that off the top, I want to make sure that we're clear on what decisions have to be made to use that. And I, I don't mean clear to the point of you can only use it on a project in whatever, but clear with the policy direction that is needed from us 
so that we're not put in a position of, well, this sort of meets, but not really. So I want to, as we get through to that guidance document, maybe that doesn't come back to us until June, um, just make sure that, that we follow up on that. So, Com Commissioner, um, that's one of the things I think we envision bringing forth in March. I think at that point it would just be sort of what the process would be, how we would engage with you or our external partners, whatever that might look like, not knowing if it's going to come to fruition or not, but to really set the, the process so that everybody's really clear, clear in the transparency of how the decisions will be made. And, and I think just, sorry, last one. <laughs> because this depends, if I understood Travis correctly, this depends on how much federal funds we actually get in the first place. Correct. None of this is even uh, for sure, but if we did get it, it gets you back to you. Right. Exactly. So I, I think we need to be really clear with that decision that we're making also is we're not just carving it off top. We're carving it off the next layer of if we get those funds. Yeah, Commissioner Brown, some of you are carving it off the bottom. Uh, and if we get all the way down there, then yes, you'd have that opportunity to invest those funds. Given that you will not be here in December, getting us your thoughts is really important. So if this I like two plus. Okay. All right. Well, then that's clear. All right. Commissioner Simpson, did you have your, okay? Commissioner, we're good? All right. Uh, good direction. Thank you very much. Uh, we've heard a lot of input, and you listened and put it right in there. So thank you. Okay. Now we are going to go on to... Freight plan, I'm sorry. How about this? Would anyone like to approach us on the STIP process? Seeing none, there we are. <laughs> All right. Uh, we did have a couple this morning and we took those into account and so. Uh, I oh, okay. They want flexibility, good, we talked about that. That's <laughs> All right, gentlemen, so now we are going to go to our last item, which is uh, requesting approval to adopt the amended Oregon freight plan and approval to adopt the supporting information for the amended freight plan as part of the record, including findings and compliance with the Oregon statewide planning goals. So, Mr. Havig, shall I turn it to you? Uh, yes, thank okay. you, Chair Bainey. Uh, for the record, my name is Eric Havig. I'm the planning section manager for the Transportation Development Division. And I guess we are standing between you and your weekend, so we'll do this very quickly. Um, but we are here for the action to approve the amendment to the uh, uh, 2017 Oregon Freight Plan. And just as a reminder, um, Oregon did adopt their freight plan in 2011. We were one of the first states to do so. Uh, but with the FAST Act uh, came requirements that all states adopt a uh, statewide freight policy plan, including a number of elements that we didn't have in our 2011 plan. So we needed to update and amend our plan to be in compliance with those federal regulations in order to keep those federal freight, freight formula dollars flowing to our state so we can invest those in our transportation infrastructure. So we moved forward with those improvements or those amendments to the Oregon Freight Plan uh, and that we've held a public hearing uh, that we uh, did in September and made those amendments and we're now bringing this plan to you for adoption so we can move forward. And I'll turn it over to Scott, and he can talk about the process since we were last with you and what those changes are, and then get your action. Uh, for the record, Scott Turnoy, Freight, Pro uh, Freight Planning Program Manager uh, with ODOT. And uh, uh, since uh, we came to you in September for the public hearing, which wrapped up the two-month uh, public review period uh, for the amended Oregon Freight Plan, uh, in, during that period, we received three official comments during that time period, and we received a fourth outside of that uh, period that we brought to you um, as it came to us before the period. Um, we, since that meeting, which uh, officially closed the public comment period at the end of that day, September 22nd, um, we've incorporated the, the public comments, uh, one in particular uh, from Southern Oregon concerning a railroad, a rail system need. We added to our uh, rail system needs inventory, uh, which is one of the appendices in the amended plan. Um, and we also addressed uh, several uh, references uh, in the 2011 chapters and content, um, basically fixing broken links in the, in the document and then adding references to the new amended content in Chapter 9 and Appendices G through J. Um, so just trying to tie the whole document into one kind of cohesive amended plan. 
Um, since those changes were made, we took a revised draft to the Oregon Freight Advisory Committee uh, back in October, uh, received concurrence from that committee uh, to bring the uh, final uh, version to you for this meeting uh, for adoption. Um, so that's really the uh, kind of uh, public outreach um, and the stakeholder comment uh, opportunities we've and, and changes we've made uh, since September uh, to the final version. Um, one uh, piece that came from FHWA, we did have a comment on the investment plan section of the draft. Um, we had been in communication with FHWA division office here in Salem throughout the amendment process, basically from beginning to now, um, and had uh, a lot of concurrence with uh, the division office on our approach, especially with regards to the investment strategy section. Um, however, they received some um, differing uh, direction from uh, FHWA headquarters in DC as, as to which years to include in the table in our plan document. We had initially planned to include and had in our public review draft fisc federal fiscal years 18 through 22, showing the investments of the National Highway Freight Program funds and matching uh, towards projects during that five-year period. The new direction from FHWA headquarters uh, encouraged us to include f federal fiscal year 16 through 20 into the plan, which reflects the FAST Act period uh, of funding that we know of. So that's the reason for the change. We've since made that change, and uh, the version in front of you now uh, incorporates that those federal fiscal years and investments and match um, for projects. That seems logical. It's their plan. Um. So uh, just to kind of wrap up, um, we have uh, a couple of notes just to reiterate the stakeholder outreach and engagement. We've, we've touched a, n a number of different organizations, different levels uh, of jurisdictions, federal, state, and regional and local um, partners and stakeholders uh, throughout our process, uh, including Freight Advisory Committee, the Rail Advisory Committee at the state level, MPOs and ACTS uh, at the regional level, et cetera. Um, and so I, it really brings us to today uh, with the final draft in front of you for adoption. Okay. And so we are here for the adoption today. Um, with your approval today, we'll be working with the director's office to send an official request to Federal Highways Division Office uh, for them to endorse our plan because that's the final action that we must get is the federal action to keep those monies flowing. And again, we have been in close contact with the division administrator. They know our approach and they know how we're going to be moving this forward. So we anticipate this will move smoothly. Excellent. Well, given that broad outreach and consideration of comments, I can't imagine that we won't have concurrence. So comments or please, Paula. So, Christian and I appreciate Brown. all the updates and all the outreach during that. Anything negative? I, the, the, uh, during the public review, well, prior to the public review uh, period, we received a letter from Metro, which we shared uh, during the July uh, public review draft presentation. Um, about the uh, critical urban freight corridor designation mileage. Um, that, I think, is the closest thing we received to any negative feedback, and that really wasn't negative so much as requesting additional miles for um, the Portland metro area. And so that was included, or were you unable to make, I, you know, my brain doesn't remember all those things. <laughs> okay, mine either. Uh, were you able to give them the extra mileage designation, or because of how tight the urban area was, you couldn't do that? So uh, that's, that's really the only thing you weren't yeah, able? Yeah, Com Commissioner Brown, we were limited in the amount of mileage that we can do on the uh, urban I, and, the, and the rural I mileage based now. upon the... <laughs> the federal guidelines, okay. and we, we just didn't have mileage to give you out. You couldn't, you couldn't trade out. I remember right. this discussion. Okay. So th those are really the negative things we heard is there, there was more requests for mileage than we had available, and of course there's more requests for money than we have available. <laughs> Always. But, um, but that was really it. Okay, great. Well, well, what is the formal process we would have to go through in order to increase mileage? Um, there is a federal, or Commissioner Simpson, there is a process that's outlined in the FAST Act that will increase the state's mileage every five years by 3%. Um, and that's controlled again by the statute and the FAST Act that will increase that mileage. So when we bring the plan back to you in five years, because we have to update it every five years, um, we'll have an opportunity to amend that mileage. Plus we can even move it if we've completed a project to another area of the state that might be ready for an investment. Okay, if we feel ready, I'd, I'd welcome a motion. Uh, Madam Chair, I move that the Oregon Transportation Commission adopt the 2017 amended Oregon Freight Plan. I also move that commission adopt 
the supporting information for the amended Oregon Freight Plan as part of the record, including findings of compliance with Oregon's statewide planning goals listed in Appendix C of the amended Oregon Freight Plan. Wow. Almost as though it was written for him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do we have any further questions or comments? All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, Aye. motion carries. Well done. Thank, Thank you very process. much. Thank yes. You. And with that, I believe that concludes our meeting. Uh, do we have anything else for the good of the order? I would just like to say uh, travel safe, Paula. I know you're headed out of the country. And uh, I'm incredibly grateful for the investment of time and effort that goes into this commission on a volunteer basis and grateful for the, the work that gets done every day protecting those that are in Oregon and live in Oregon too with the ODOT team. So have a wonderful Thanksgiving. We are adjourned. <laughs>